Are you are you listening? If you are, let me know. Jacob, you still there? You still awake? Because Jacob won the MERP for his school district, the Mobile Emergency Response Plan. So Jacob, uh, we'll make sure that you um, you're going to need to contact me, and I'll hopefully have your information from Sabella, and uh, we'll get your school district set up for that right away. So um, I'm waiting to see if Sergeant Stefan Bij is on. Can you hear me? It says I'm on, and I see his logo. Can you hear me? Yeah, Gary, I can hear you. <laughs> How have you been, my friend? I am good. How are you? <laughs> I, it, you know what? If I was any better, I would be you. Um, we first met at um, Ilita. Yes. Is that where we met? Yes. And then um, I had the opportunity to come out and speak to his group. And uh, one of the reasons why I wanted Steph here is because of his passion and knowledge in helping law enforcement with autism. So I'm going to let you take it away. I'm going to shut off my microphone and I'm just going to do what I do best. I'm going to listen. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Gary. All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I want to say it's my pleasure to be on with you uh, this afternoon. Um, as Gary mentioned, I met Gary couple of years ago at um, Ailita down in St. Louis. Uh, we've stayed in contact. I actually had him come out for uh, my local organization uh, to talk about school safety and had um, Gary come out and present for us. Um, but my passion, as Gary mentioned, is autism. And um, I'm sure we're kind of wondering, why are we talking about autism? How does this affect us as law enforcement? Um, and obviously we know how it would affect us in schools, but how does it really affect us in law enforcement? And truthfully, 3.5 million people live in this country with an autism diagnosis every day. Um, it's estimated that anywhere between 10 and 20 percent of our calls for service with law enforcement will involve somebody with a disability. Autism is the fastest growing developmental disability in the world. Um, so that is why we're discussing it today, because it's not if you have contact with somebody with autism, but it is when. Um, a little bit of my background, as Gary mentioned, I am a sergeant with the Edison Police Department, uh, which is just located uh, about 25 minutes west of the city of Chicago. Uh, just in my career, I spent five years in patrol. I spent 10 years in our gang unit, uh, three years as a school resource officer, um, and I was promoted to sergeant four years ago, well, four and a half years ago now. Um, and I'm currently assigned to our midnight shift as a patrol supervisor. Um, but the biggest thing for me is in 2013, my two youngest sons were diagnosed with autism. Um, and after my wife and I got over that initial shock of having this diagnosis with our two sons, we set out to become advocates for our sons, to learn everything we could possibly learn about autism and how to be their voice, their advocates as they grew older. As we learned more about autism, I wondered what would happen if my two lives, meaning my professional life and my personal life collided as we as law enforcement, are we really prepared to handle calls involving autism? And do we really have the skills and the knowledge to safely interact with children and adults on the autism spectrum? So I will start you out with this letter that was sent to my chief a couple of years ago. Um, and just I'm gonna have to read it verbatim, but just in summary, what it says is that this concerned citizen that lived in our town um, had some real worries that us as a police department lacked the knowledge, the skills, and the ability to interact with his son safely. Um, from my background, this parent who sent this email to my chief, his son was one of my students in the schools. So I knew his son very, very well. Um, I had positive interactions with him. And I understood some of the dynamics that his son had. Um, his son is a rather large kid. He's now 17. Um, and he's almost six foot and he's about 200 and he's about 250 pounds. So he's a bigger kid. Um, so my, my chief and I love him to death. He's one of the best. He said, I don't even really understand how to respond to this. Can you reach out to this, this father? So I did. Um, and 
I basically explained to him how we handle things within our department. Uh, but this, this email, this letter is really my inspiration for why I've been doing this for the past several years in training law enforcement um, and how to safely interact with people with autism. What I also do is I took my role as a school resource officer for three years and I began to understand what is our, really is our role as a school resource officer or school security personnel. And we know that it's to provide safety to the school and all children within the school. We obviously, our goal is to help manage crisis situations, which provide the least restrictive environment to all children. Key factor there, right there, least restrictive environment for all of our children within the schools. And then we also want to train in all aspects of school, school day to create a partnership between the community, our parents, school to keep all children safe and protected. But I began to wonder, are we really trained how to interact with children with autism? In a school setting, things are a little bit different. You have additional resources. You have your paraprofessionals. You have your teachers there to assist you. Um, but there is going to be an instance where you are going to be called as a school resource officer or school security personnel, where you're going to be asked to assist in a call or um, a request to assist with a child with a disability um, who may be experiencing a meltdown, which we'll get into in depth in a few seconds. Um, or how do we do that? How do we really handle this? The first and foremost, the most important thing we have to do is understand what autism is. Really, the word autism is Greek, and the root means alone or isolated. And really, that's a great way to describe autism. It is a state of being alone or cut off. Um, individuals, adults, children on the autism spectrum, they have their own little world. The world operates around them, but not they're not really in it. Um, and I've always said it with my two sons. They will play around other kids, but not necessarily with other kids. Okay. Autism is a complex neurodevelopmental disorder that has no known cure and no known cause. There are a lot of theories why autism occurs. Nothing really scientifically proven for sure. Um, there is the idea that vaccines are the cause of autism. That theory has been debunked several times over again. Um, the doctor that actually came out with that is out of Great Britain, and he, he had to surrender his medical license. And a lot of people that supported his study saying that vaccines were the cause, had to retract um, that they supported that. The correlation between vaccines and autism is really those milestones that we're looking for for our children, walking, crawling, things like that. They coincide about the same time um, that the characteristics of autism start to manifest themselves or start to become clear. They also correlate at the same time vaccines are administered to our kids. So that was the correlation, okay? Autism is a part of larger group of disorders called autism spectrum disorders. And throughout this afternoon, you'll hear me refer to autism spectrum disorders or ASD. Um, that is what I'm referring to. Autism affects normal brain function and development in three major areas, social interaction, communication, repetitive behaviors, and difficulty in adjusting to change. Hmm. That becomes some of a, somewhat of a problem for us as law enforcement, because why? We use those things to do our job every day. We use social interaction. We use our ability to communicate. Okay? Those restrictive and re repetitive mannerisms and behaviors that people with autism demonstrate, they are red flags for us as law enforcement. Okay? Difficult in adjusting to change. Really, if we respond to something or we have an involvement with something, we are an unexpected change, right? Nobody calls us to say, hey, can you come visit? I just want to tell you I'm having a great day and you come visit me at my house. Well, that's not the case. People call us as first responders, law enforcement, firefighters, when they're having a very bad day. We are part of, we are not part of that routine. Um, so these are critical things that we need to understand um, for law enforcement and how we're going to handle things and why these characteristics are so important for us to understand. We know that autism can be reliably diagnosed at the age of two. And with my middle son, um, he was diagnosed at the age of four. Um, for us, as parents, my wife, um, her mommy senses kicked in and really realized at about 15 months of age that something was off with my son, Zach. He wasn't developing the way he should. Me, Denial as the dad, said, you know what, he'll catch up. He's just, he's just developing a little bit later. Okay. Fast forward two years down the road, my youngest son, Andrew, was born. Uh, and we start seeing this, some of the same characteristics with him that we saw with my middle son, Zach. Um, so at that point, they were both diagnosed in 2013. Zach was four at the time. Andrew was just was right around two years of age. Um, 
currently there's no singular proven cause of autism. There are a lot of theories of why autism um, occurs. We know there's a genetic component to, component to it because scientific research has told us that if you ha- the likelihood that you have a second child with autism when you have one is about 80%, just like it is in my case. Autism, we know, is a lifelong diagnosis. It is never going away, and they will. my sons will live with their diagnosis for the rest of the year. But it does not mean that autism is not treatable. Usually it's done through intensive therapies like occupational therapy, speech therapy, ABA therapy, and a lot of different things um, that help them overcome some of the deficiencies and some of the characteristics they have associated with their diagnosis. Okay. Some key things that we want to understand when we're interacting with autism. Individuals with autism may have very unusual responses to sensory experiences, such as certain sounds, the way objects look. They may be hypersensitive, meaning they're overly sensitive to certain things, or hypo or undersensitive to other things. So we're talking about sight, sound, smells, um, touch, things like that are important factors for us to understand. Looking in a school setting, we know that lunchrooms can be very hard because they're very loud. There's congested, there's a lot of people. Change passing periods within schools, very difficult for a child with autism within a school district to overcome some of those things because of that hypersensitivity that they have. Autism is also called, considered a hidden disability, meaning there are no physical outward characteristics that you can look at somebody and say, yes, they for sure have an autism diagnosis. With some disabilities like Down syndrome, we know there's some physical features that go along with that that can help us identify these disabilities, but autism is hidden. You cannot look at somebody. So the goal is to really focus on their behaviors and their characteristics of how they interact to make that give us those red flags to say, this is possibly an autism diagnosis. Symptoms can range from mild to severe, meaning they're lower functioning. And lower functioning individuals will need probably lifelong care. Um, They're usually contained in self-contained classrooms. Uh, I will need um, assistance in getting through a school day. Moderate functioning, again, kind of in the middle of the road. Again, they will need some assistance in certain areas, but may be very independent in others. And then we have our higher functioning individuals, and this would be considered our Asperger's diagnosis. They're considered the higher functioning side of the autism spectrum. Um, They may be able to be um, in general education classrooms, may be able to operate their day with some um, accommodations, but otherwise function normally within school. Um, they, They can work. They should be able to drive, they can get married, they can have children, they can function normally in society once they are, overcome some of the characteristics of their autism diagnosis, but they're higher functioning individuals. Okay. About three quarters of the population with autism also have a co-occurring or comorbid diagnosis along with that. These may include anxiety, ADHD, fragile X, which is a genetic disorder, depression, gastrointestinal issues, obsessive compulsive disorders, seizures, Tourette syndrome, an intellectual disability, sleep issues, and motor difficulties. So on top of this autism diagnosis, about three quarters of that population will have another co-occurring disorder. Uh, with, my, with my sons, both have an anxiety, di- anxiety diagnosis. And then for my youngest son, he also has an ADHD diagnosis. So when you pair all of this together, it makes this old diagnosis significantly more difficult to work with because you're now battling these comorbid or co-occurring conditions. In addition, there are some physical characteristics with autism that are important for us to understand. About 40% of the population with autism will suffer from seizures. Um, I am very lucky that neither one of my boys suffer from seizures. It's one of the few things that we don't really have to worry about with them because we've never had that issue. But in addition, some of the physical characteristics are this. People with autism or on the autism spectrum have are hypotonic, meaning they have low muscle tone, which inhibits their ability to breathe um, during stress Uh, In a prone situation, it can be considered physically weak or unsteady. Uh, This becomes a problem, especially in a restraint situation, um, either out on the street in a law enforcement situation or within a school district. Um, That prone position is very um, dangerous for an individual with autism because of their underdeveloped trunk muscles. It does inhabit their breathing and makes it very, very difficult for them. Asthma and heart conditions are also very, very common as well. Remember that with that hypotonic, the seizures, and that asthma and heart conditions, placing them down in their stomach really puts them in greater risk for positional asphyxia 
um, than it does the average person. We know that positional asphyxia can set in very quickly. It's significantly faster uh, for a person on the autism spectrum. Key components that we need to understand. Okay. So here's some autism characteristics or autism statistics. ASD occurs in all racial, ethnic, economic, and social groups. It knows no boundaries. It affects everybody equally. 2020 Centers for Disease Control, CDC numbers, report that one in 54 births will have an autism diagnosis. That number is jumped just from two years ago, it was one in 59. Two years before that, it was one in 68. Five years before that, it was one in 88. The numbers are growing every single year at staggering rates. This one in 54 is a little misleading. And what the CDC does when they're calculating this is they take from birth to age year age eight, and they look for the autism diagnosis between that age gap, and that's where they get this number. What it doesn't account for is that those individuals, they get diagnosed later in life. Um, if they get diagnosed 10, 11, 12, or high school, or even as an adulthood, they are not calculated into this number that we see. Autism is four more times greater in males than it is in females. So it's about one in 34 boys and one in 144 girls. Why that is? No one is really sure why. Personally, I think the female population is underdiagnosed. Um, I think that number is probably a little bit closer than what that those numbers suggest, but um, there's still, it does afflict boys, males more than it does females. 31% of the children with ASD will have an intellectual disability along with their autism diagnosis. My son, Zach, has a borderline intellectual disability on top of his autism diagnosis as well. Um, but on the flip side, about half, about 44% of the children with autism will have an above average, an average or, or above average intellectual disability ability. Some of the greatest minds in the world have a high functioning autism diagnosis. It's sometimes, a lot of times autism does not affect the intellect or the understanding, but it does affect is the characteristics and the behaviors. And that's critical for us to understand. About 35%. 35% of adults aged 19 to 23 with autism have never received postgraduate education after leaving high school. This becomes a significant problem because there is a significant lack of resources for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, we know within our school districts that they can stay within that school district the day before their 22nd birthday. But after that, what is available for them after graduation? Um, what kind of job training? What kind of education can they get after that? And truthfully, there really is a lack of resources. So what happens is with a lack of resources, they are now pushed out into society with no real options or viable options. And what happens is they fall into our lap as law enforcement. Um, so that's a critical thing. So some things we're working on um, is trying to push that the job training and education after they're done with high school to be able to get them productive and place in society that they have. Okay, So we're really going to focus on three main areas today. Repetitive and restrictive behaviors, communication difficulties, and social impairments. These are the three main areas that we're going to discuss today. We're going to give you some de-escalation strategies, and we're going to give you some strategies for how to safely interact um, in a couple different settings. Okay, So that social interaction, some things we need to understand. People with autism will have a reduced eye contact, meaning they won't really look at you in the eye. It doesn't mean they're being deceitful or um, not engaging. That's not the case. But what the problem is, is when you're having a communication or communicating with somebody with autism, they can only do one or two things at the same time. They can look at you in the eye, but they won't be able to pay attention to what you're saying. There's too much going on with their facial features. So don't force the eye contact. You want to check for their understanding, but don't. we don't want to force that eye contact if we can. Um, difficulty in receiving and expressing emotions. Um, people with autism will say they have a flat affect face, meaning they don't know show their um, emotion, whether they're happy or sad, okay? There's difficulty in relation, developing relationships, meaning when you have struggles with social interactions and communication, it's difficult to form positive relationships. Doesn't mean they don't want to, they do, which is very, very difficult for them. Difficulty in using nonverbal social communication. We know that a significant part of the way we communicate as humans is through our body language. But if you can't read that, um, it becomes difficult to understand social situations. No respect for personal space. And we don't understand, children with autism really don't understand those social boundaries or what is too close. 
becomes a difficult thing for us as law enforcement because we don't really want people to get into that space for us, right? We see that as a threat, an officer safety issue. So it's critical for us as law enforcement to understand that they're not trying to be aggressive or um, attack us. They just don't understand those boundaries, okay? Uh, may not like to be touched, and this is critical. We will have situations at some point within a school setting or a law enforcement interaction where we may have to touch an individual with autism. A very good strategy with this is give them a warning. Hey, listen, I'm going to touch your arm. I'm going to touch your hand. We need you to stand up. It's critical that you give them that warning because we talked about that hyper and hypo sensitivity. Sometimes the slightest touch can be the most painful thing they've ever experienced. Uh, if you're going to do that, give them a warning. Um, lack of interest in others. And again, we kind of talked about this is the world operates around them. They really don't operate in it. Um, so there's appearance of this lack of interest in others. Um, and another important thing that we understand is there's no understanding of consequences. This is a very difficult thing in a school situation or in a law enforcement interaction is they're not going to understand that if they don't comply with our orders um, or commands, we obviously as law enforcement will escalate that because of that. They're not going to understand that. Um, they don't understand if you do this, this is going to happen. That cause and effect portion of it is not there. Um, so making idle threats and things like that are going to be ineffective when interacting with somebody with autism. We're going to talk about behavior right now. And this is critical for us because if we understand what the stimulus or what the motivation behind their behavior is, it will help us to safely interact and de-escalate in situations where that we see those behaviors occur. It's the, we know that our behavior is the way we respond to a particular situation and or a stimulus. And really, there are four main functions of behavior that we're going to pay attention to. Number one is attention. Our behavior is action. We want to draw someone's attention. The next one is escape. And for children, children, adults with autism, escape is critical because if they're in a situation that's overwhelming, their goal is to get out of that situation. So understanding that motivation behind the behavior. Next one is something that's tangible. We want something, whatever it might be, their demands. Um, and the last one is physical or sensory needs. Um, and that's usually in a situation that is overwhelming, okay? What they need, if they're too hot, too cold, basic human needs. But for an individual who can't really communicate or lacks that ability to communicate, guess what? We see these problem behaviors occur. So it's important to talk about these behaviors and we'll talk about how this is critical when we talk about some de-escalation strategies in a second. Okay. Those restrictive and repetitive mannerisms that we discuss. So those stereotyped and repetitive mannerisms, restricted interests, inflexible adherence to routines, and preoccupation with inanimate objects. Critical areas that we're going to talk about. For those stereotyped and repetitive mannerisms, for us as law enforcement, what happens is we see these mannerisms um, and we think that it's the appearance of somebody who's under the influence. So clearly it draws attention to us as law enforcement. Um, and we'll talk about it, but stimming is that one of those key repetitive mannerisms that we will discuss. Stimming is a good thing, and we'll talk about um, some different versions of stimming that we'll see. Restricted interests. So it could be a lot of children with autism have very restrictive interests. For my son, my middle son, he is infatuated with commercial airplanes. Every plane, every airline, you name it, he understands it. This is a good thing for us because we can use that restricted interest to build rapport, to help build that relationship. If we engage them with that restricted interest, guess what you start to do? You start to build rapport with an individual. Use this to our advantage. Inflexible adherence to routines. Um, in a school setting, this is great because we know that schools are very, very structured. Um, schools with children with autism use a lot of picture schedules, basically laying out how their day goes. The problem is, is when we get involved in law enforcement, we are an uninspected part of their routine. So we've already set behind, we start this ball rolling where we can have this escalation of behaviors because we've already deviated from their routine. Um, picture schedules and set things um, are important um, in utilizing these things. And obviously, we have preoccupation with inanimate objects, and it could be anything. It could be a piece of string, a stuffed animal, a blanket, whatever it is, but that inanimate object is the most priceless thing they own. Um, if it's not a threat or not a safety issue, please, please, please just let them have that item. Um, in the long run, it will help you de-escalate the situations a lot quicker. Um, oh. So in addition to refusing to 
that set schedule, many individuals had these OCD tendencies. And I will tell you, these are pictures from my own house. Um, these are my sons. Um, and we see how they, the, the commonalities of lining things up, having things in order, absolutely will happen. It absolutely will happen in a school setting, will absolutely happen in a home setting. Um, critical thing to understand with this is, if these items are set up like that, please, please don't interfere with them. The aftermath of when you're interfering with what that is um, can be can escalate them significantly higher. Uh, those OCD endings are great because here's another positive thing that we can utilize is there's a very set and rigid routine of structure and rules. This is great for us because what happens is if we say, listen, Jake, you need to stand up with us because the rules say you have to walk out of this classroom. Using that to our advantage to interact safely is a great thing. Um, use that to our advantage as the rules say this. Um, it's a great play for school security and our school resource officers if you are responding to something within your buildings um, where your school staff is requiring or asking for assistance. Um, and we talked about stimming those restrictive or repetitive behaviors. These are the ones we're going to look for. So there is a visual stimming with staring of lights, repetitive blinking, moving fingers in front of their eyes, or hand flapping. Auditory, maybe tapping of ears, snapping of fingers, making vocal sounds, or humming. Uh, tactile is rubbing the skin on one's hands on an object, so we see a lot of it with kids rubbing their hands on carpet or different textures. Uh, vestibular, and it's that sense of balance, so we may see some rocking back and forth or rocking side to side. And occasionally you'll see some spinning, um, depending on the child or adult. Taste, um, if you've ever heard of the term pica, this is what this is. It's the placing of body parts and or objects in one's mouth or licking objects. This is my youngest son. He is a strong um, oral fixation on things, so it's not uncommon for us to have, use a chew tube or different items to um, kind of help him along with that. Um, the next one is smell, smelling of objects and or sniffing of pe people. <clears throat> this is critical because sometimes smells are very overwhelming for a person with autism. So this could be a good thing and or a bad thing. Um, my young, my middle son, Zach, is hypersensitive to um, the smell of um, jasmine. My wife had these air fresheners in the house um, and he went bonkers, bonkers. We couldn't figure out what it was and it was the Glade air freshener plug-in. Um, that was driving him us. The olfactory senses were overwhelmed and it was sent him um, kind of spiraling out of control a little bit. We talked about the sensitivity to light, sensitivity to sound, sensitivity to touch. This is critical for us to understand, especially in a school setting, because we know that school settings can be overwhelming. We know that school settings can be loud. Um, we know that school settings can be very light. And we know there's that sensitivity to touch. Um, so these are critical things to understand um, and if you have some problem behaviors, it's reducing these things that we want to do. We have to, we, critical thing we have to remember is that a person with autism, their senses are very heightened compared to that of a neurotypical person. So it's very important for us to understand um, they don't experience things the same way we do. Um, some critical tools to use to do this are turning off lights, using noise canceling headphones, um, and obviously giving that warning to touch if we have to. Okay. Um, some signs of overstimulation that we're going to look for in a, in a school situation or even a law enforcement situation, um, we're going to look for that hand flapping. We're going to look for pacing. We're going to look for rocking. Um, we're going to look for scripting. And I'll talk about scripting in a second. We're going to look for those loud verbalizations. These are all things, are red flags that we're overstimulated um, and we're getting to a point where we're getting to, too overwhelmed. So we have to start to reduce that overstimulation to kind of bring them back down from this. Scripting is important because scripting is just the rehearsing or repeating of particular lines from movies, books, things like that. Scripting may seem like nonsense babble, but if we read deeper into it, because of the lack of vocabulary, scripting can be important because they can be using those lines from movies and books to vocalize what they're experiencing. So it's very critical that we listen to what is being scripted. Key points. Stefan, I'm, I'm, I'm okay. moving your slides and I think I'm During out that overstimulation, when they're overstimulated or too overstimulated, what's going to happen is we're going to get a meltdown. A meltdown is a loss of behavioral control. Um, they've hit the point where they cannot handle the situation anymore um, and they're losing um, control and they melt down. Um, we can see some aggressive behaviors. We can see self-injurious behavior, meaning 
head banging, throwing themselves on the floor, banging their head against items. Um, and the last one we're going to see is elopement or wandering. And that is just, they are trying to get out of that overwhelming situation. So they will flee um, a safe setting because of that overstimulation. Okay. So when we see the meltdown, this is kind of the stages of a meltdown that we look for. Um, those pre-meltdown signs are, this is where intervention is critical, um, especially in a school setting because you have the ability, you have an environment that you can control in a school setting. So we see this rumbling stage and that's those signs we're looking for, that hand flapping, that rocking, that pacing, that scripting. These are the signs that we wanna look for this pre-meltdown intervention. And this is where we need it. So we reduce that overstimulation. Um, we use our calming strategies, which we'll give, I'll give you some in a second. Um, once we get out of that stage, we now enter the rage stage. And this is where that explosive loss of behavioral control um, occurs. And this is, at this point, safety is the main concern. Um, in a school setting, if this happens in a classroom, um, there are a couple ways to handle this. Number one, we either want to remove that individual from that classroom and or we want to remove the classroom from that individual. It may be easier to move an entire class than to move a student that has now experienced the meltdown inside of a classroom. Um, once they come out of this rage stage, important critical fact is this rage stage may last up to an hour plus, depending on a given situation. Uh, patience is critical in these situations. Once they start to come out of that, um, they may not even call what happened. This is where empathy and support is critical to get them to de-escalate. Um, to get them calmed down. Because if we don't, they can go right back into that rage stage if we don't use um, these coping strategies that we're gonna, we've developed. Okay. Here are some of the strategies that we're gonna, we want to employ. And these are pretty universal across the board. And I will tell you, um, these strategies I have used with my own son. So I'm not pulling this out of anywhere. This is from my own experiences. A lot of what I'm talking about today are from my successes and failures of interacting with my own two sons. Stefan, so, can you hear me? I'm ignoring the problem behavior is a critical thing. This is a very difficult situation because can we really ignore aggressive behavior? Can we screaming, yelling, crying, vulgar language? The answer is yes, we have to. Because even negative reinforcement is still reinforcement. By acknowledging that problem behavior, even with a negative response, you were still in reinforcing that behavior. So it's critical that we have to ignore it. We want to avoid words that act as triggers. No stop not now instead of that we want to use a positive strategy meaning uh, instead of stop hitting we just try saying let's use nice hands let's have a calm body let's take deep breaths critical things we're not we're having a positive response and negative negative response no stop and not now can sometimes act as trigger words um, if we have calm areas and if you're in a school setting for your school security personnel or your school resource officer um, hopefully a school has a, um, a sensory room um, or a therapeutic room, they're great. Um, if we can get that student into that room, that is great because we can reduce that stimulation and get them to calm down. It may not be always easy to bring that student to that area, but using that, getting them calm enough to get them to that area is a great thing. You may have to create your own therapeutic room wherever your setting is. So that's reducing the overstimulation, removing students, removing teachers that aren't necessary and things like that. Stefan, um, can you hear me? Great, another way is preferred sensory activities. We as law enforcement in my department, we carry sensory kits in our squad cars. They endorse canceling headphones, um, alternative communication devices, um, fidgets and things to help them de-escalate. Um, very minimal cost, worth their weight in gold. In a school setting, if you have these items, um, I su highly suggest using them. That helps de-escalate things. Deep pressure is the next one. Um, and our sensory kits that we carry in my department, we have a weighted lap pad that can be used as a weighted item. Deep pressure is critical because it, it is soothing. Um, even giving a big bear hug, depending on the student, may be the most calming thing they've ever experienced. Uh, my kids used to do a thing, it's like, I can't even explain it, but they called it the car wash. And it was two big rollers and they would squeeze him through it. And it was that deep pressure that would calm him down. So they called him his car wash. Um, so he was escalated to say, mm, we're going to go to the car wash and he would get up and go and go right through his little car wash. And it was the deep pressure, um, that was soothing to him. It would de-escalate him. Um, calming breathing exercise that we can utilize. So what I do with my sons and it's very, it worked very well. We smell the cake. We take a deep breath in through our nose, blow out the candle, deep breath in, smell the birthday cake, blow out the candle. Um, in a law enforcement situation, we talk about what tactical breathing, right? 
We know the tactical breathing helps lower our heart rate, helps calm us down. It's no different in a meltdown or um, a situation with autism. Those calming breathing strategies are great ways to help them de-escalate them quicker. Okay. Uh, language strategies, and important for us is we know that there's an absence or delay in language. About 40% of the autism population will have a delay or an absence in language. So they may use stereotyped or repetitive language, and that's that scripting that we talked about. Uh, there is going to be some difficulty in initiating or maintaining a conversation. Those reciprocal conversations that we can have really suffer with autism. Um, there are deficits in tone of voice, so they may be super loud, super quiet, or almost have a voice that's almost robotic-like. And we know that there's a lack of social play because we have those difficulty in interacting in social situations. Um, important thing, concept with language here, and these are the things we're going to understand. There's a difference between receptive language and expressive language. Receptive language may be uninhibited or unaffected with children with autism, meaning they may be able to receive the language that we're saying. They may be able to understand everything that we're saying but it's the expressive portion that lacks and it's the ability to communicate or express what you are feeling or seeing. Um, so there's not a response. It doesn't mean they're not understanding or receptive to what you're saying. They may be able to understand. They just can't express it. Um, a lot of times if receptive language is not really influenced in some instances, it is it just depends on the situation, but just because they're not answering doesn't mean they're not understanding what you're saying. That receptive component a lot of times is there. Okay. Some communication strategies, speaking clearly, concisely, um, clear, concise commands, one command at a time, using a calm, quiet voice, um, checking for understanding, making sure they understand what we're asking. Great way to do this is have them repeat back what you asked. Um, if they can do that, then we have no, they've understood what we said. Um, a last part is no slang or abstract language. If you tell a child or an adult with autism to go take a seat, they're going to walk over to a chair. They're going to pick it up and they're going to say, where do you want me to take it? Very concrete thinkers. So we have to be very clear in our um, commands or what we're saying. Um, give extra time for those responses. You may have to give a 10 to second, 10 to 15 second window for them to get a response. Okay. Repeat or rephrase certain things. Um, you may have to repeat it. Um, after that 10 to second, 10 to 15 second window, you may have to repeat what you're asking. Um, an important thing is one person talks at a time. We as law enforcement are horrible with this. Um, we'll have two, three guys in a call for service and are all barking orders, barking orders, barking orders. Um, please just take your time. One person does it communicating. Okay. Um, another def deficiency we see with communication is echolalia. And echolalia is just repeating back the last phrase that they have heard. Um, so for instance, What's your name? You may get a response of, what's your name? Where do you live? Where do you live? What's your phone number? What's your phone number? Well, it comes off as if they're being evasive, uncooperative, and it's not the case. It's just they are trying to communicate. They just don't have the ability or the words or the vocabulary to be able to do that. Um, when given a choice, they may always repeat the last option they had. If you have a situation with echolalia, you have to change your... Um, strategy and how to communicate. Okay. A great way to do that is first, then praise. And these are commands that we want to utilize. First, we're going to stand up. Then we're going to walk into the calming room. Once they do what you want them to do, that's when the verbal praise comes in. Great job listening to me. Great job calming your body. Great job walking to our sensory room. Um, first, then very clear, very concise. First, we're going to do this. Then we're going to do this. That verbal praise comes in only after they comply with what you have to do. This is a great strategy. It's very clear, very concise, very easy for them to understand. Great strategy to use. Um, useful commands that we may say. So in a hitting situation, we want to use quiet hands or nice hands. For aggressiveness, we may say we need a calm body. Uh, in wandering issues, we want to say stay here and stop in an emergency situation where we may have to. For kicking, we want to use quiet feet, nice feet. We talked about those trigger words, no, not, and stop. Here are some positive ways to be able to interact with them and use positive commands to get them to comply with what you're asking. Alternative forms of communication that we've utilized. Um, so when I was in the school district, um, I went to our school district, our director of special education and said, I want to create um, a set of PEX cards or picture exchange communication system um, 
that's geared towards law enforcement. So we created these PEX cards, and these are the ones you're looking at at the top. Um, They're geared towards a law enforcement situation. Are you hurt? I'm here to help. I'm a police officer. Um, we're taking a page from the school districts and utilizing some of the resources that schools use and incorporating into our um, bag, of tr bag of tools that we have as um, law enforcement. Some may use a iPad to communicate, an assistive technology device. Um, let them use that. And for those of us old enough on this presentation to understand what old speak and spell was, that's exactly what this is. They type in what they want, and the, the iPad actually does the communicating or speaking for them. Um, social stories are a great resource as well. Um, if you're in a school district, utilizing them to create social stories. Um, we use social stories for our fire drills, for our active shooter drills, for our tornado drills, for emergencies within the school. Visuals are a great way to communicate and for them to understand what you're trying to communicate. Um, again, social stories for first and then. Um, I do have some resources for social stories for a lot of law enforcement situations. Um, you'll have my contact information and please reach out if you are looking for those. Okay. So we're talking about this in a school setting. So here's some of the headlines and these are very recent headlines and I go through pretty regularly to look at what we're seeing and what we're seeing. Um, these are only about six to eight weeks old. So a seven-year-old with autism handcuffed by a school resource officer and pinned to the ground. Ucha, Ward, I'm gonna, my friends from Boston are going to kill me, but it's Worcester police officers handcuffed 10-year-old boy with autism, fracturing his arm. Lawsuit alleges. Police shooting of a boy with autism in Salt Lake City leads to call for more crisis intervention teams. That 13-year-old one, um, that's a very unique situation and setting in that one. But these other two involving police officers in a school setting. And I've seen countless videos of school resource officers handcuffing children with autism because they're having behavior related issues. Rather than utilizing some of the strategies we talked about, they're going to use of force situations immediately. And this is what's getting our school security staff and our school resource officers into a lot of trouble. There are much better strategies to deal with um, our children with special needs. There's also a significant portion of the population that says that children in schools with disabilities are arrested at a significant higher rates than those that do not. Um, so, which is why this is so critical in a school situation for our SROs and our school security personnel. Okay. Uh, we know they're seven times more likely to draw the attention of the police because of their characteristics, but they're also likely to be more victimized. If you don't understand socially, have the lack of ability to communicate, you are the perfect victim. Uh, we know there's an increased service and personal danger because we don't understand those consequences. Um, there's an alternate sense of personal modesty. Um, and then we see those unusual behaviors. All these are red flags or triggers that will draw attention to law enforcement. Okay. Perfect victim. So an older article, and this is from 2015, and there's nothing more recent that's, that is the problem. But 35% of individuals with special needs, specifically ASD, have been the victim of a crime. So it's physical abuse, sexual abuse, property crimes, neglect related issues. This is critical as a school resource officer in a building because we know as SROs, we are the first line in detecting abuse along working hand in hand with our school staff. We are that first line. So it's critical for us to recognize some of the characteristics and signs of autism um, and know those deficiencies so that we can recognize some of the signs and characteristics associated with abuse and neglect related issues. Um, critical for us to understand. Um, some of the expectations with people with autism or disability, privacy and sense, and sense their own body, could, because they need assistance with their assisted daily living skills, it's not uncommon for them to be unclothed in front of an adult or a stranger, somebody who's assisting them. This opens them up for being victimized um, sexually. We know the expectations for life and achievement. They have the idea that there is a low expectation of life uh, for life and achievement, so they get targeted. Um, children with disabilities are very obedient and passive because they rely on other individuals to help care for them, which means them, that leaves them open for trust related issues. A history of maladaptive behavior. We know in abuse and neglect situations, there's usually a behavior, a negative behavior associated with it. When you have a history of maladaptive, maladaptive behavior, you don't really see that. And obviously we see that social isolation because they can't disclose, you can't communicate. They're again, the perfect victim. Okay. They're targeted because of that perceived vulnerability, deficits in expressive communication, and deficits in detecting that deception. Critical for us to understand those things and be conscious of 
are signs of a child abuse and neglect related issues because we are that first line as school resource officers in those buildings to protect those children with disabilities. Okay. Some things that you will respond to in the school systems or within the school, um, self-injurious behavior. So a student with autism has been denied access to a request that's been made as a result of started striking and hitting himself in the head. Aggressive behavior. A student with autism is triggered by noise in a cafeteria. A student grabs in their student's hair and is not responding to commands. How do you handle this? Okay, you reduce that overstimulation. You clear that cafeteria. You clear an area of it at least. Okay? Um, bolting or feeling from the building. A student with autism who is known to wander bolt is missing from the building. This is another critical thing that we're going to talk about right now. Um, we know as children with autism, it changes a little bit. So what happens is autism and age, hitting as a child is one thing. But as they get older into high school, hitting becomes a battery and assault. Playing in parks becomes pedophilia. Pocketing of preferred items becomes a theft. Invasion of personal space becomes stalking. As children grow older, the attitudes for those unusual behaviors start to change. And now we're talking of our high school, even collegiate, our college-aged individuals with autism, um, they may be there. These things that are their normal behavior that were accepted as a children are not as an adult. So the attitude starts to change. Um, some of the reactions that we're going to see to the police defensively striking out. This is communication. What's key for us to understand is that this striking out is communication. Okay, It's understanding the situation. Um, they'll run away. They'll grab at the officer's equipment or maybe unresponsive to commands. Reactions from the police. So we know these interactions can be frantic and very challenging, okay? What I tell law enforcement personnel, whether you're in a school resource officer setting or on the street, is don't take it personal. They're not trying to act out individually against you. It is the given situation um, and the circumstances that what it is, and you just happen to be there. Um, it is very common for um, officers to take things personal. Please do not. Um, Remind yourself that ASD is, cause, is the cause of the challenge behavior and not something else. They're not trying to be aggressive. They're not trying to be difficult, but they can't because of this autism diagnosis. Their behaviors are very, very challenging. Some realistic expectations. These calls can be very time consuming. A meltdown can last an hour, hour and a half. Um, knowing this ahead of time will fend off your frustration during this interaction. If you know that going into that, this could be very long, you're mentally prepared for it and know how to handle it. Um, the next thing is don't expect a well-mannered obedience because you're not going to have it. You're going to have some horrible language, some aggressive behavior. Again, understanding that, don't take it personal. And it's critical at this point to ignore that behavior because, like I said, even negative reinforcement um, is reinforcement. Okay. Um, wandering elopement of things, and this is critical for schools as well. We know that about 50% of the people with autism will wander from a safe environment. Accidental drowning accounts for 91% of the lethal, 91 of the lethal outcomes in children in wandering events with autism. Other dangers are dehydration, heat stroke, hypothermia, encounters with strangers. And there are three main types of wandering that we really want to discuss. Number one is goal-directed. They want something. Um, it's usually when a preferred activity was stopped, their goal is to get back to that preferred activity. So it's critical to understand what they were doing just prior to that wandering event that will help us lead us to where they may go. Bolting and fleeing, and this is sensory related, meaning there is a reaction to something that's typically a sensory overload. My youngest son runs out of the building during fire drills because the sound is overwhelming for him. He can't handle it. So if he's close to a door, he is out it because of this. Um, and the last one is wandering and left unattended, they will just wander off. And this is my middle son. If I just left him outside, he would wander off with no particular agenda or destination and would just go. Uh, it's critical to understand what the characteristics and motivation behind wandering events are to help us see, to um, get them. Uh, and I want to talk about this case. This was Avante Akendo. And Avanto, Avante Akendo wandered from... Uh, a school setting in October of 2013. Um, there were some critical mistakes done by the school. Um, a school security guard saw Avante wandering around the building and called out to him and said, excuse me, but Avante couldn't communicate. He was mute. Um, so he just wandered out the front, the door, and didn't realize it. 
Uh, it took them several minutes for them to realize, his staff members to realize that he had wandered off. School security guard said, oh, I saw him in the building, and they started their search inside the building first. Well, the problem is Avante had gone out of the building. Um, he wandered off, and Avante's body was located um, in January in the East River in New York City, um, and he had drowned as a result of this. Um, there were some critical mistakes done by the school district of how they handled things, things like that. It's critical to understand that in Avante's IEP was mentioned that he wanders um, and has the propensity to wander. Uh, was missed by the school district. So the school district, when this one was held liable, and they settled for, I believe it was $2.7 million in Avante's death. Um, but in as a result, um, New York passed Avante's law, which is, gives funding um, to help and with resources for uh, missing children or wandering events with children with autism. But again, there were some things the school district did very wrong where they could have probably prevented this from happening. It took their, his aides an extended period of time to realize that Avante had wandered off. Um, rather than looking at the cameras to see where Avante went, they just started their search inside the building, which was another critical error that they made. Okay. Um, and he's wandering on moment events. Treat him as critical. Interview with the parent caregiver. Understand their likes and dislikes. Ask about a tracking device. Many children with autism have tracking devices. Many families do utilize them. It's critical to ask. Um, search your water first. If you take nothing from me today, and this presentation is on a watering event, you search your body of water first. Other dangers are roads, trains, construction sites. Asking about your likes and dislikes. Um, important, critical if you're going to use a dog for that search, understand if they're scared of dogs. Um, ask whether they'll respond to their name. They may or may not. Um, information out to the public. And this is critical. Reverse 911, your social media, the media. Get it out as quick as you can. And last but not least, don't give up. These kids are incredibly resilient. And because they don't have that fear of consequences um, or that hyper or hypersensitivity to certain things, they can survive out um, in the elements significantly longer than the average person can because they don't have those same sensations that we do. Okay. Um, important to understand the ADA and how it affects us in law enforcement. Just remember, a lot of times police departments are in violation of the ADA, not knowingly, just by we don't understand it completely. Okay. Some critical things to do is a lot of these are in rest situations where individual with disabilities behaviors are misconstrued and are now become arrestable offenses. Um, and that's where a lot of the law, civil liability comes through with the ADA and law enforcement. A lot of this occurs in schools as well. So it's important as the SRO to understand the dynamics of what the behaviors are and not misinterpreting that as criminal behavior as opposed to reactions from the disability. Okay. The discrimination liability courts, it's really wrongful arrest situations I see the most. Failure to accommodate is the number one, but those are very difficult cases. Um, but clear, we need to understand those things. Okay. Some programs that we utilize as a department. Uh, we've worked hand in hand with Medical Alert. Uh, we're pretty familiar with Medical Alert. They've been around for 75 plus years. Uh, they have a program called the Elite Program, which is a law enforcement agency portal. It's a free program, and we can get um, free resources out to our families with special needs, um, shoe tags with identifiers, and a bracelet. Um, for our older students, um, it's important that we can utilize autism information cards. They can hit their name, address, contact, caregivers, um, and then strategies for their interaction. Because they can't communicate, being able to disclose that bills disability are critical uh, to get it to us. Um, in Illinois, we have a thing called Premise Alert Program, which is basically just a special needs registry. Um, we work in hand in hand with our school districts to get all of our students with special needs in my community registered. So we know going into calls for service um, what we're going to interact with, what kind of diagnosis, is, any triggers, any calming strategies, any favorite places. Um, this is key in getting us the information before we even arrive. Smart 911 is just a um, pre-registration program for the county, register cell phones, cars, things like that. Um, it's offered in our county in Illinois. Okay. Some other programs that we utilize, we do a special needs resource fair in conjunction with our school district. Um, we register all of our um, special, needs special needs students in these programs, explain our programming with the parents, um, and it helps build that relationship with your special needs community. We have a meet and greet where we have a meet and greet with our special needs families in our police department and our fire department for that matter. Um, we want them to feel comfortable with us. We want them to understand we 
understand their disabilities. Um, again, we work this in conjunction with the school districts. They are our best resource because they know our special needs students. So working with the school districts is key. And then we also do a parent training in conjunction with our school district. Um, so our, our special ed co-op group, every year I go out and I do parent training for them to understand what we are going to do as law enforcement and what our expectations are and then the programs that we have. Again, we're starting to build that relationship with our special needs community. Because I'll tell you, as a parent of children with special needs, I was very hesitant to call my local police department uh, until we started working with them. So um, programs that are very easy to implement, that don't really cost you anything, that um, build incredible amount of relationship with that side of your community. Um, this is one of the programs we do. This is our special needs soccer event. I coach a special needs soccer program. That email I showed you in the very beginning, um, that is the father. His name is Sean Danhauser. This is his program. Um, he's the coach of this program. Um, I met with him and his parents to talk about some of our programs. I fell in love with the program. Um, I am now a coach, and my two sons um, participate in the program. Um, every year we have a first responders game where we talk about we have our police officers and firefighters come out and they are buddies with our kids for the day. It helps our officers interact with them. It helps build a relationship with our family so they understand what, what our role is law enforcement. We're also in a setting that's comfortable with our kids. Soccer is a very positive thing for them. So if we come in, we're just another buddy that's going to help them. But it shows our officers as well that these kids are just kids. They have amazing, unique qualities, but ultimately they're still just kids. Um, and don't get overwhelmed by the disability. Look through that and look at the kid. Um, some of the things that we do. Okay. Additional um, resources, we, like I said, we carry sensory kits. Um, this is a website. We are working on getting these sensory kits out to first responding agencies, law enforcement, firefighters at no cost. Um, this is the website. If you're interested, please, we are always looking for sponsors to sponsor kids. The goal is to get these kits out to um, agencies at no cost. Um, we started handing out window cleans to our community so that we have that information and parents can safely disclose that their child has a disability in their home or in a car. It's a great way to do um, share that. Okay, uh, kind of in closing, by adopting this proactive uh, approach and educating our officers about autism, police departments and school districts and SROs working within those buildings um, can reduce their exposure to liability. Okay, understanding it, knowing these procedures, um, and to ensure the safety and cooperation with a person with autism is critical. So, understanding what you're dealing with is is, is an important factor that we have to do. Um, and I leave you with this. One in 54 children have autism. Two of them are mine. I do this because maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but some law enforcement officer, some firefighter, some s school security officer are going to interact with one of my two sons. I want to make sure that you have the best information out there to safely interact with them so we don't have an unfortunate incident, we don't have a misunderstanding. Um, so that's kind of where I leave you. Um, if we have time, I'll have, I'll take some questions. Um, here's my contact information, um, my work email address, my business email address, my phone number and, and my website. Um, please feel free to reach out to me. Um, a lot of the resources that I do have, um, are free, are the free resources. And I've worked to put these teams together at no cost because I understand how budgets are with school districts and police departments that I put these things together to try to get them out at no cost. I am happy to share any of the resources that I have with any of you. So I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Uh, and I am open for questions. Stefan, can you hear me? I don't, I don't know if Stefan can hear me. Let's see if he can see me. Move your headphones. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you, Gary. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. So, uh, first of all, I'm going to say what somebody else already said. Amazing presentation. Well done. I love how you relate everything back to SROs and how they can help the students. Um, I, I want to apologize because I was not cycling your slides correctly. I apologize. It took me a while to get on track. Um, so, how often are you giving these presentations a day? Because I, I think that's what it almost comes down to, isn't it? Yeah, and really, I, and we need to do it because um, um, we, I try to do this all the time. So this is, I think, this week. This is probably I was in Tennessee last week. Um, something got canceled this week. I was supposed to do a couple in person this week. So I'm probably doing three, four, five a month easily. 
for different agencies, for law enforcement, firefighters, probation is the new one we're doing a lot of. Um, so we're doing a lot of that. I, I'm just telling you that was um, absolutely phenomenal. Uh, not only what you're doing, but what your entire agency is doing. And, and I'm, I'm just hoping that the people that are here today um, reach out to you so that this gets, this goes out everywhere. It, it just needs to. Um, it was phenomenal. Um, anybody else have any questions? Thank you. How do you approach, uh, this is a great one. How do you approach lockdown drills, fire drills training for students with autism? Great question. And we, I ran into this. So this is why um, what we did, um, we prepared, especially with our sons. And then even when I was in the school district, we created visuals. Um, we created a social story. Um, for fire drills, for lockdown drills. Um, and the visuals very help, especially for the lockdown drills. Say, so what we did is we utilized the rules say this. So what we did is we would say, um, the rules say we have to turn off the lights. The rules say we have to lock on the doors. The rules say sometimes we may have to leave our classroom. The rules say we might have to follow the teacher if we leave. So those things, but creating that set of visuals was very, very effective with it. Um, there are some good, there are some good books, um, geared towards kids with special needs. They're great, but I have to look, but I'm pretty sure I still have my visuals for fire drills and lockdown drills and tornado drills from my time in the school district. Fire drills are another one. And we had to prepare him ahead of time. So we weren't like surprise drills, but he had his headphones ready to go because it was the only way that he would follow the rules with his fire drill because he would just freeze or take off. Um, so having those visuals ahead of time were key with him. Today, we're going to have a fire drill. We're going to have our headphones ready. We know what to do. And he would follow it reluctantly, but he would follow it. But having those visuals were critical. Um, so having that set built in is great. So one of the things when we had, um, they called them stack units, and I don't know what the acronym was for, but they were for students with autism. And we were given permission from the fire department that the, the those were the only students who knew that teacher knew there was yeah. going to be a fire drill. And, and, and really because um, we knew we were going to get the kids out safely, but we didn't want to, because this drill that's mandatory, it caused a whole series of other problems. So when working with the fire department, they said, yeah, we understand that. Mm -hmm. Have them go ahead and put their headphones on. Because we know that if it's a real fire, we'll just deal with that issue too. But it's kind of like when some of these people want to do these scary drills. Why make it a scary drill if what right. we're just trying to do is teach them how to exit the building properly? Exactly. Exactly. And that was one of those things we had to do. We had to tell them. Otherwise, he would freeze. Because the first time, um, it was a couple of years ago, he was in his gym. So his gym converted his to his cafeteria. So the first time it went off where he wasn't prepared and didn't have his headphones, um, it triggered him and he bolted out the door, my youngest son. So they grabbed him. Um, but I will tell you, he automatically associated that gym with that fire drill. And it took us a year to get him back in there to eat lunch for an entire school. Wow. Year, he ate in the hallway because he associated that fire drill, that gym. He's like, I'm not going back in there. That thing's going to go off the minute I walk in there again. So it took us all school year to get him back in the following year, second week of school, they're working on it. And what does it do? It goes off again. I'm like, Oh, we're so close. So it took us several months to get him back into that gym for lunch. And it's, uh, you know, you're going to have those issues, but if you can prepare them and utilize their headphones and I mean, they'll follow the rules. They'll know what it is once you get them set. But if you throw in those other sensory overloads, they're just going to shut down. They're really just going to shut down. Wow. That was great. Anyone else? Sergeant, I really appreciate you, you being here. I wish we were in Vegas together um, because I know we would just be sitting around talking the entire yes. time about how we can help these children and help officers. Because really, um, you know, I, the thing that I, uh, that, that from your presentation, I didn't realize that students with their children with autism were more likely to have positional asphyxia, yes, which is something we all, we all train about, you know. Right. So, and a lot of our strategies, our CPI and Menta or whatever strategy you're using, a lot of that uses that prone on right. the ground technique. So we have to be very critical, very worried about that. Those that CPI and stuff is not in some situations is not good. My son, my middle son has very underdeveloped trunk muscles. And it took us, 
years of occupational therapy to get him to be able to sit in a chair for more than 15 minutes without slumping over. Um, so those, you know, those CPI and those strategies, they're, are great, but with children with autism, they can be very dangerous depending on the situation. No, oh, that's great. Well, again, thank you very much. Um, I hope everyone has your information. They're going to get all these PowerPoints. And again, I apologize. And uh, don't be a stranger. All right. I won't. I won't. And obviously, reach out if you needed something, Gary. It was a pleasure. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. All right. And with that, folks, our four day conference comes to an end. And I want to thank everyone for attending. Um, our door prize winners, you will be contacted. And I just want to remind um, our team in the Philippines, if you want to be able to go to bed, since it's uh, 530 in the morning right now <laughs> in the Philippines, um, we're going to jump on our Zoom call and close this out. But for the rest of you, be safe and keep fighting the good fight. Thank you very much.